HGTV. <laughs> Hi, I'm Claire Breviegas, and in this edition of The Immigration Show, Michelle Sicriu speaks with Dr. Inez Mongul, who came during the Franco-Spain era. Hello, my name is Michelle, and today we're going to be talking to Dr. Ines Mangio about her experience and what it was like to leave her life behind and start a whole new one in a different country. Hi, Ines. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Um, so first off, let's start about where you immigrated from. You said you immigrated from Spain, right? Yes. Specifically Franco Spain. What was it like to live in that kind of environment in Franco? It was um, very safe in an overly protective way. Um, Franco was a dictator and he had a very firm hand on what could be done, what could right. be fought, right. what could be written, what could be painted, what could be sung. Um, and um, he was very repressive. So uh, it was a period of relative piece that was very stilted and difficult, right. particularly for the younger generation. Right. How did that um, shift your perspective on like how you lived your life and how you communicated and um, how you basically um, lived in Spain, like under Franco? Mm. Well, I was, I was a rebel um, and my parent was prominent. In, um, in the place where we lived. So that created some tension between <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> my parents and I. Um, but on the other hand, um, I, was, um, I was lucky to get a really good education and um, um, a very comfortable life. Um, to satisfy my rebellious side, mm -hmm. of course, was go I was going reading what was forbidden, listening to forbidden music mm -hmm. that we would get from South America, um, and having a very um, avant-garde um, group of people my my <laughs> own age and a little older. Right. Um, one of the good things that I'd have to bring from that group is Pink Floyd <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Cortázar. Those uh, the, that that that's the kind of you know um, off the grid kind of right. stuff that right. we and uh, we and the group was doing. <laughs> yeah. So Spain has a very active nightlife, as we can see in like different <laughs> pictures and stuff like that. Yes. So because you were kind of rebellious, did you participate in a lot of like nightlife things and like going out to bars and stuff? Yes. What was um, your like experience? Uh, with that? Bar bars uh, drinking in. Spain is a little different than drinking as in United States. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a, a Spanish bar would be more like um, any of the chains, the chain restaurants that serve drink. Uh, give me some of them, like um, uh, TG, uh, TGIF, TGIF or something yeah, like yeah. that. Um, so you go to a bar, mm -hmm. but you go to a bar to eat and drink and right. meet friends and chat and right. whatever. So yes, I did a lot of that. <laughs> um, but let me give you an example. When, when a Spaniard says, um, um, let's, meet for, let's meet at lunch, mediodía, let's meet at noon, right? Yeah. It's not 12, it's 2 or 2.30. Really? Yes. And why is that? Because 12 is in the morning. <laughs> And when you meet for dinner, you don't meet at 6 or 7 or even 8. For dinner, you meet at 9.30 or 10. Oh, wow. So you're out on the street until 3 or 4 in the morning. Right. If you have to work the next day. Oh, if wow. not, then you stay up <laughs> until 5 or 6. Yeah, it, oh it's crazy. I, yes, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. The energy, those Spanish right. have. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Um, so under Franco, there were obviously, like, different police that would come and like investigate an interview. Were you ever like had to be interviewed? Did you ever like have to experience stuff like that? And how did that like make you feel? How did that feel in the moment? Um, the 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 people that were in that um, group that was not my mainstream, the ones with Pink Floyd and Julio Cortázar, <laughs> um, they they had a rougher time uh, than I did. They were more vocal. They were maybe less privileged. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they were more courageous than me. 
But I remember specifically two times when I was really, really scared, um, both of them in Madrid. Um, one evening, I'm in a place with, for music and drinks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was also very counter-revolutionary. I mean, right. there were lots of interesting people there. And uh, suddenly, uh, the door slams and says, everybody, uh, Manos uh, arriba. Uh, um, everybody's arms up, and um, it was Los Grises. It was the the secret police coming in to raid in this right. this small little place, um, and I was interviewed, and I was scared out of my wits. Oh my goodness! It, it was so scary. Um, I didn't. I, I I I had no idea why. Why are they coming here? Right. They, there was. There was no sedition, there was nothing. There was a whole bunch of young people listening to really, um, I remember coming back from the United States and I brought them the Harvest Moon uh, LP from uh, Young, um, <laughs> Neil Young, because it had just come out. I'm going, ah, look at what I have, <laughs> you know? It's, but, yeah. Right, must yeah. have been terrifying there to was, yeah. experience that. Another was in the uh, Plaza Mayor in the middle of Madrid, that um, 16th, um, 17th century, 16th, 17th century, huge big square. Um, and it's night, and all of a sudden you see a whole bunch of young men running from oh up. Goodness. And then you hear the clops of the horses. Uh, the mounted police was um, pursuing some young people in the square. It was just there. Yeah, oh my it was goodness. Just, yeah. That's insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how did that, those kind of experiences shape who you are as a person? Because I, like, that kind of stuff has a permanent effect on, like, what you think about and what you're scared about and, like, the fears of everyday life. Um... I... Maybe because of Franco, I became more radicalized. If it had been easier to just disagree or have mm. um, uh, a more respectful discussion where different points of view or different opinions um, were accepted and respected, then maybe I would not have to push so hard right. against. Um, what was the norm, um, but but I don't know. I know who who can uh, who uh, nobody can say what the world would have been, what reality would have been if it had been otherwise. Right. Uh, it was what it was. Um, I, I think I may have uh, 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 a more complex understanding of how difficult it is to govern um, disparate mm -hmm. types of people. Um, Spain is, very, is t definitely a very small country, it's right. a little bit over 30 million inhabitants, but there are seven different languages. Oh, wow. Not dialects, languages. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot for such a small country. <laughs> yeah. And um, and there is a there are very stark differences between uh, uh, the, the people in the south and the people in the north, or the people from Extremadura and the people of Barcelona. Or right. uh, uh, it's so it's it's very it's a very disparate society, a very um, integrated society, but still with a lot of pride and separation of cultures within. So uh, yeah, I, I mean not not that I would recommend that anybody do it the way Franco did it with suppression and punishment. But, right. but it is difficult to govern wisely when there are so many different factions in the people right. you're governing. Right, right. So was that the reason that you left Spain? Because of like the harsh governing and because of all the scares and everything like that? Or was it for a different reason? Um, the, the, what was happening there made it easier for me to leave. <laughs> right. But the reason I left um, was because I was married to an American citizen, and he was ready to come back, so I followed him. Wow. How did you meet him? 
at the country club where my parents uh, where, where at the country club where my parents had their membership because they lived in the same complex. Oh, wow. So you were a part of a very privileged, per se, kind of upbringing compared to a lot of other people. Compared to a lot of my friends? Yeah. No, I, <laughs> I, was, I was one of them. Right, right. Um, so was it difficult to move from the country um, because your family lived there and like all your friends, um, was it difficult to leave to America, a place you never knew, or was it kind of easy because you were rebellious and you kind of... It, it was very conflictive. I, 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 st I still remember the sorrow of leaving as something physical. Right. And I don't know how my dad managed to get on the runway because it's forbidden, but I saw my dad with these huge cloth handkerchiefs that he used, and he's just blowing. I mean, oh my gosh. yeah, no, it was it was really difficult yeah. to leave. Yeah, that must have been very difficult to leave your parents, basically everything you know, my parents, to a completely my different friends, place. My culture, my people, right? My uh, yeah, the lifestyle that I right. that I had, and it, right. yeah, it was really bad. So, did your parents bless like your marriage with your husband, who was an American, completely different? taking you away from them? Was that kind of hard for them to grasp? They were um, not, not terribly because <laughs> <laughs> I had been very rebellious and right. I had gone through a whole number of boyfriends <laughs> uh, and nobody met with, um, yeah, uh, anyway. Um, and uh, my first husband was, um, it's um, a very smart guy, very elegant, very wasp, um, so it, it was okay, it fit. Uh, yeah. They did not want to see me leave, and um, yeah. Right. And the only way that they sort of um, got used to it was that I was going to go back every year <laughs> and spend two months with them. Right, that's amazing. So you mentioned that your husband was very smart um, did you follow kind of in that when you moved to America? Did you go to college and go to school for different things or? I started university in Spain. Oh, you did? Yeah. And um, finished it. Hmm. When I first, I didn't go even, no, I did, yes. <laughs> I couldn't, why, yes. No, from, um, I continued in, uh, I first in the United States I lived in Maine, and I went to University of Maine in Portland. Okay. Um, then I continued university in Spain because we moved back for a few years. Then I finished there, and then came back and I started my master's in Washington State and after the master's, I went to the doctorate and finished it in Washington State. Okay, so what did you major in? Like, what do you do for a living now with that? I'm, I have my own, I'm a private practice. I'm a psychologist with specialties in neuropsychology and behavioral medicine and some forensic work. That's really cool. So you probably use that a lot in different cases and stuff, I'm guessing. That meaning? Meaning like you probably use your psychology knowledge in um, different areas. Like yeah. what kind of areas do you use them in? Well, my profession is psychology, so yes, right. I, do, I right. do use a lot of psychology. Um, in behavioral medicine, I, I, um, I work mostly, no, I work with, um, medical patients, so it can be amputations, it can be chronic pain, it can be cardiovascular, it can be any other number of things. Oh, wow. um, in neuropsych, I work with um, brain injury, whether it be acquired or congenital, you know, it can mm -hmm. be cardiovascular, it can be through a trauma. And both of them um, I use in treating the, you know, regular psych, disorders such as depression or anxiety because right. it, it, it's all the same. We're, we're a system. Right. So yeah, it's all the brain and the body and the body and mind and yeah. So talking about depression and anxiety, that's a very mental health kind of based 
um, idea. So what are your like insights about mental health with what's happening in the caravan and like um, with the children being put in cages and stuff like that? Um, what these, and uh, again, I, I'm, I'm not very comfortable with generalizing, so I want to uh, do this with a caveat that I understand that there are no two people that are the same. Um, but in general, the experiences of separation and isolation and uncertainty um, that these children uh, went through at first when, when, um, when well, when they were arrested and taken into cages, mm. I'm not going to say anymore, or what is going on now at the border where uh, these children are um, participating, whether participating in a constant state of alarm. Right. Uh, that is changing the actual brain of these people. Really? The, these children will have brains that are different than those of children who did not have to adjust right. to this horrible, non-controllable right. danger that they're right. presented with. Right, so that kind of toll on the human mind stresses out these children. That kind of toll on the human body mind. It's not the mind, it changes in the brain. It's a physical change. Oh, wow. And, and by now, because of the advances in, in um, in technology, we can actually measure how the brain of traumatized children is different. Really? Yes. That's crazy. And you can follow it in the development. The brain of the brain is the most plastic organ in your body. Oh my goodness! It changes as you learn. Yeah. This this is this is not. <laughs> the mind, right. it changes as you grow, right. as you learn. Right. So when you learn to be afraid, what do you think your brain is learning? To be afraid. Right. So do you think like these things that these children have been through is going to change the way that they look at different things or learn or become who they I are know when they're older? I know they will. Really? You, um, I mentioned um, uh, my work as a forensic psychologist. Um, when, uh, when I spend 12 or 16 hours with a defendant um, getting their history and testing them, um, m I was going to say more often than not, no. Always, I can trace their history to trauma. Wow. And often repeated and continuous and chronic trauma during the, the, the really important years in the brain development. Again, um, so um, the brain is the most plastic organ in your body, but it is most plastic from um, e even before we are born, mm -hmm. um, the trauma in the mother gets passed on to the fetus. The child, yeah. um, and the brain is still, I mean, it's, it's, it's not gelled through. Right. So um, and from zero until age 21, 23, the development has not uh, finished. Really? So the experiences, the learning, that we participate in from zero to 21 or 24, mm -hmm. depends uh, on the researcher, that's going to lead us to who we are, how we right. view the world, and how we view ourselves in the world. Right, right. So as a forensic psychologist, you probably see a lot of these cases with like immigrants being on trial for what they've done and stuff like that. How do the stories like in the paper kind of differentiate through what you see? Um, so I started doing forensic work in 1990. Boy, I'm so old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 1990, 
So 1990, so it's 18, so it's 28 years? 90, yeah. yeah, 28 yeah, 20 years. years yeah. So I've been involved in a lot of uh, cases of homicide. Wow. Um, not once have I read a, a story in the paper about the case I'm involved with that looks at the person I'm seeing. It's like they're talking about two different people really? together. Oh my it's, goodness. It's, it's, yeah, it's striking, it's appalling. Yeah. yeah, that's insane. That must be kind of, not necessarily frustrating, but just like heartbreaking to see these kind of, not necessarily victims, but these people. Not, not, not victim, because right. again, you know, there's, there are some people that have been, I've right. uh, evaluated that I'm really happy <laughs> they're going to spend the rest of their lives away from us, okay? Right. So fine and dandy. Um, but it's about, the, it is, it's about the laziness of some media in providing us with information about the really complex issues we need to understand as right. a society. Right, right. And to, to, you know, regurgitate something easy and easily digestible and titillating mm -hmm. and really exciting because, oh my God, they're so horrible. <laughs> um, how, how does that help us understand anything? Yeah, for sure. That's, that's very difficult to kind of hear that, I mean, a lot of us already know that a lot of our media is very tainted to what's easily digestible and what's easily heard and what's mm -hmm. easily seen. But to know that it's that much more kind of tainted in mm -hmm. a way that it's like a completely different story, a completely mm -hmm. different person, like mm -hmm. that's alarming. So that's why I'm counting on you guys. <laughs> yeah. So what's it like being in kind of a male classified kind of occupation? Mm -hmm. That must be kind of hard and difficult. Mm -hmm. It's probably a fight <laughs> to get into also. Mm -hmm. Uh, you want to you wanna hear an anecdote? Sure. So I am um, working with the federal public defenders in LA and we had a trial and I had to testify. Mm -hmm. So we had a trial. Um, so um, I, the attorney and I meet and Dr. Mongeo says, <laughs> well, um, the they will call us when you're ready to testify. Let's go up to the attorney's room and wait. I said, okay. So we walk into the attorney's room and there's a long, uh, like a conference table, okay. and there's five male attorneys there, and you know they greet my attorney and um, and we talked and they, um, one of them uh, says, um, so Miss such and such, what did you bring? I uh, no, she says, are you an interpreter? And I said, no, I'm not an interpreter. And the attorney turns to my attorney and says, so what did you bring her for? The decorative element? Oh my goodness. Yes. That must have been so insulting. No, I laughed my head <laughs> off. <laughs> I thought it was so funny. <laughs> That he thought you were just there to be there? <laughs> the decorative element. So I laughed. I laughed. So then the attorney says, no, this is Dr. Mogio. She is one of the best neuropsychologists you'll <laughs> ever work with. And the guy gets all red. And oh, I'm my just goodness. Chucking. It was wonderful. I can imagine. That must have been so embarrassing <laughs> for him. <laughs> That's hilarious. It was probably kind of weird to go to school, too, because your class must have been mostly or, male. Particularly in the specialty, yeah. 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 That was, that's crazy. That's um, crazy. I, w in, in part of the rebelliousness that I had, I never considered myself a woman. <laughs> really? I was a person and I was just, you know, yeah. and I was a bodybuilder and I was a long distance <laughs> runner. <and laughs> it was just like, yeah. That's amazing. Thank you, Dr. Mongio, for sharing your story and giving us your insight on your experience with immigration. This is ECTV. Australian. 
Thank you, Dr. Mongu, for sharing your story and taking time to shed light on the immigration controversy in our country. This is ECTV, and we'll see you next time. ECTV.